Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my channel, and thank you for joining me for another true crime video. Since it is February, which, first and foremost, is the month of my birth, but secondly, the month of Valentine's Day, I thought I would bring you a Valentine's Day-themed case to really mark the occasion. Today, we're talking about 55-year-old Susan Hamilton, who was found dead in the bathroom of the Oklahoma City home she shared with her husband, John Hamilton, Dr. John Hamilton. And she was found on February 14th, 2001. Susan's body was actually discovered by her husband, John, who had come home from his job as a doctor to exchange Valentine's Day cards with his wife, only to find her beaten and battered in a pool of blood on the bathroom tile floor. Now, that very same night, John Hamilton would be placed under arrest for Susan's murder, and the entire community was shocked because no one had a better marriage than the Hamiltons, and no one loved their wife more than John loved Susan. So I have a very confusing roller coaster of a ride to take you on today, so grab your coffee, your tea, grab a snack, settle in for a tale of what happens when love takes a sinister turn and becomes a chilling tale of passion gone awry. But before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Day One Journal. Since the time I could write, I've been a huge believer in the power of journaling. Journaling can do a lot of beneficial things for you, like help you find clarity, reduce stress, help you remember the moments in your life that really matter. And I personally believe it is one of the highest forms of self-care and one of the best things you can do for yourself in a world when most of what you do is for everyone else. Day One Journal is the number one journaling app in the Apple App Store, and it provides journalers a wide range of features to help you express your emotions, chronicle your ideas, and inspirations and capture the daily ups and downs of life. Now, I have several journals with Day One, and there are so many features that they offer that I think are above and beyond what other journaling options offer. In today's world, the only place we really have privacy is in the security of our own minds, but I truly believe that getting what's in your head down on paper can have a lot of benefits. In a way, it's like releasing it so it's not weighing on you. It also helps you see patterns in your life, your choices, and your journey. So hopefully you can learn more about yourself, but I would never, never want anyone else reading these things. So having a physical journal is a big risk for me. And I've been in that position when someone's picked up my journal and read it, and I never want to go back there. It was one of the biggest boundary violations I've ever experienced. I'm not being dramatic. It was terrible, and that is why I love Day One Journal, because I can feel truly safe and free to express myself openly and honestly which is the only way you should be expressing yourself in your journal, but I don't have the fear that my words will ever be read. Not only do they have end-to-end -end encryption, but your journals can be protected by passcode and biometric security measures, meaning you can lock them with your Touch ID, your Face ID. I will say, though, that Day One Journal's premium features set them far above the rest because words are powerful. But having the ability to add video, pictures, and audio to your entries makes your words so much more three-dimensional. And when you're looking back at your entries in the future, this added text and context is going to be so appreciated and even give you a little smile and a rush of nostalgia. With the Day One Journal Premium account, you can add unlimited pictures, unlimited videos, unlimited audio recordings, and unlimited voice-to-text transcription, which comes in super handy for me because a premium account also gives you unlimited journals. And I have a Day One Journal for everything, a journal for poetry, a journal for recipes, a journal for personal musings, a journal to track the progress and the lives of each one of my beautiful children and a journal for work to jot down video ideas. Because I'm so busy during the day, my greatest inspirations usually don't hit me until late at night when I'm in bed and I have no energy to even type. So I can just grab my phone, open the handy Day One Journal app, and speak my ideas out loud with them being transcribed right into my journal. For those of you out there who are artistic, it's not me, but I know there's some of you out there, a Day One Journal premium account also gives you unlimited drawings. I know some people like to sketch out their thoughts and feelings, so you'll get unlimited drawings too. You know what else the voice to text feature is awesome for? Journaling your dreams. You know how it goes. You've got a crazy dream. You're sure it means something. You shoot up in bed to write it down, but it's 3 a.m. and who's going to go searching for a pen and paper at that hour? Or feel around to find your glasses so that you can actually see anything, but you don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is grab your phone and start talking before the details of your dream disappear. The Day One Journal mobile app has made keeping track of my thoughts and feelings and updating my multiple journals so easy and convenient even if I'm on the go. My journals are gonna sync across all my devices, my tablet, my laptop, my computer, my phone, and I can update my journals offline so if I don't have Wi-Fi or let's say I'm on an airplane, I can still keep my mental life in order. 
There are so many great features that Day One Journal offers and so many reasons why you should check it out for yourself. So try Day One Journal today. Go to dayoneapp.com slash Harlow and use code Harlow to unlock a limited time offer of a two-month free trial of Day One Premium. This is big because you might be able to find a month trial here or there, but Day One is offering my viewers a two-month trial to explore all that they have to offer. Remember, that's Day One app app.com slash Harlow. D-A-Y-O-N-E app.com slash Harlow. Go check it out. See why it's the number one journaling app out there. And if you do try them out with my code, let me know why you like to journal and how you feel journaling with day one has improved your life or made the journaling process easier for you. Thank you so much to day one journal for sponsoring today's video. And let's dive in. When John Hamilton met Susan Shibley at a friend's birthday party in 1985, he was 37, she was 39, and they were both divorced with two children each from their previous relationships. Three years later, the happy couple were married at a local country club, and on their wedding day, John gifted Susan a Porsche, or I guess if you own one of these vehicles, you can call them Porsche, but I'm going to call it a Porsche. John gifted Susan a Porsche on their wedding day. How sweet. And throughout their marriage, John would introduce people to Susan as my beautiful wife. John never tired of showering his beautiful wife with expensive gifts and lavish vacations. And the couple were described as being inseparable. Neighbors would often see John and Susan working side by side in the garden of their beautiful five-bedroom, 6,500-square-foot home located at 3056 Brush Creek Road in Oklahoma City. And they even worked together a few days a week. John Hamilton was a prominent OB GYN at Mercy Health Center, and his patients and colleagues alike respected John, not only for his clear medical knowledge and skill, but also because he was known to be gentle with his patients, and he exhibited a very reassuring, kind bedside manner. John Hamilton made people feel heard and seen, whether he had known them for years or he was just meeting them for the first time. Dr. John Hamilton also ran a woman's clinic in Oklahoma City, and his wife Susan managed this clinic and worked there two days a week. Now, the clinic had brought some drama and fear to the couple's life, since Dr. Hamilton performed abortions there on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and some loud voices in the area had consistently made their opinion on this known. Basically, they didn't like it. The clinic opened in May of 1984, and anti-abortion groups and residents near the clinic began protesting that same month, picketing outside of the clinic as well as outside of the Catholic-run hospital where John Hamilton worked. The protesters even found their way to John and Susan's red brick home on Brush Creek, causing the Hamiltons to have to repeatedly apologize to their neighbors for the trouble being caused. Now, at one point, John Hamilton publicly announced that he had sold the clinic and he would no longer be affiliated with it. But that wasn't 100% true. In fact, it wasn't even 0% true. John did sell the clinic to an LLC, but that LLC was basically created by him and put in the names of his two children, and he continued to do his work at the clinic. He would just park at a nearby Walmart and then get a ride to the clinic to avoid the picketers and the protesters. Susan also continued to help out at the clinic a few days a week, despite the growing unrest that was taking place outside of it. Now, Steve Jimerson, who's John's friend and the best man at his wedding, he said that Susan was very strongly pro-choice and she wasn't ashamed to talk about it. She and John shared that outlook. But friends were worried about the couple's safety. Steve Jimerson said, quote, there were things done that were dangerous. I mean, trying to set fire to the clinic, vandalizing the home, just putting brochures all over the neighborhood and their kids' school, wanted, dead or alive. End quote. A week before Susan's murder, a wanted poster had been left at the clinic, which read, quote, a reward in heaven will be bestowed on anyone contributing to bringing this murderer to justice, end quote. And in the days leading up to Valentine's Day 2001, an anti-abortion group had applied for a permit to stage another protest outside the home of John and Susan Hamilton. 
But in February of 2001, John and Susan had been married for almost 15 years, and they were happy despite all of this drama and despite the protesters and the conflict that their work at the clinic had done. They were happy. They spent a lot of time together. In fact, all of their free time was spent together, going to dinners, socializing at their country club and charity banquets, hanging out at home. John and Susan Hamilton were more than husband and wife. They were best friends. In his marriage to Susan, John was the reserved, soft-spoken one, choosing to let his gorgeous and glamorous wife dazzle, just proud to have her on his arm. Susan was described as being very put together, poised, and always well-dressed, like a model. She was talkative, charismatic, full of positive energy, and anyone with eyes could tell that John was smitten with her. Vesta Hall, a nurse who worked at the clinic, said, quote, She was beautiful, vivacious, intelligent, just a really neat lady. I told some people at the clinic, I wish I had someone that would look at me the way John looks at Susan, end quote. Susan's best friend, Sherry Coffey, echoed this sentiment, saying, quote, I think John was so astounded that he had her, that he had such a wonderful, perfect wife, in his opinion, end quote. Susan grew up in the small Midwestern city of Sepulpa, Oklahoma, where she was the only girl out of the five children her parents had, and she and her brothers all put in time working at a local cafe owned and operated by the Shipley family for years. Mary Webb, who was four years behind Susan at Sepulpa High School, said, quote, she was one of those people that when she walked into a room, everyone looked. She was this beautiful girl that all the younger kids looked up to, end quote. After graduating from high school, Susan earned her bachelor's degree from Oklahoma State University before getting her master's degree in special education from the University of Central Oklahoma. Susan would eventually meet and marry Dick Horton. She would have two children with him. And after her death, Dick Horton would say that although Susan had a great education and could have done anything, her passion was always to be a mother and she was proud of that title. But even though Susan's adult life was full and busy, she always made time for family and friends. Colette Bell, a classmate of Susan, said, quote, She was a joy to know. The first thing you remember about Susan is that she was just as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. She had that big old grin and would do anything for anybody. She was always coming back to either stay with her mom or see her brothers. She never forgot her roots. She was gone, but she wasn't gone because we saw her so often. She burned up that turnpike, end quote. But on February 14th, 2001, Susan would be gone, and she would no longer be driving that turnpike to show up in Sepulpa with her big smile and infectious positivity. John Hamilton would later tell police that he'd been up early that morning for a surgery scheduled for 7 a.m. at a private clinic. This surgery was completed within an hour, and after that, John stopped at Mercy Hospital, where he had another surgery scheduled for 9 a.m. A colleague of his, Dr. Karen Rysick, saw John that day at around 8 a.m. while she was in the doctor's lounge. Dr. Rysick said that John was talking on the phone, and it sounded as if he was on the phone with his wife, Susan, having a normal, lighthearted conversation. But for some reason, even though he had a surgery scheduled, John decided to run home between his surgery at the clinic and his surgery at the hospital. And he claims he did this so that he and Susan could quickly exchange Valentine's Day cards. Maybe John thought that he could make it there and back in time since the Hamilton home was only a short drive from Mercy Hospital. But John was actually quite late to his scheduled surgery with his patient on the table and ready to be put under but Dr. John Hamilton was nowhere to be found. When they couldn't find him, the hospital paged John, and he arrived at Mercy Hospital. He scrubbed in, and then he performed his surgery with no issues. Afterwards, John decided to go back home and grab his address book. He arrived at 3056 Brush Creek Road at approximately 10.45 a.m., which is when he claims he found his wife Susan dead on the floor of their master bathroom. At 11.06 a.m., John called 911. When police arrived, John was wearing a black sports jacket, green dress pants, and a white dress shirt, but he didn't have on a tie or shoes, and his socks were soaked in blood. Susan was in the upstairs master bedroom. Her face had been beaten until it was unrecognizable, and there was blood everywhere. The first law enforcement officials to arrive described the scene as very violent, very gruesome. Susan's head had been repeatedly bashed into the tile floor, and she had received several blows to the left side of her head from some kind of blunt object. Oddly enough, 
two men's neckties were found in the bathroom with Susan's body. One had been wrapped around her neck, the other was found behind her head, and they were both soaked in blood. Now, initially, the police wondered if Susan's murder might have something to do with the Hamiltons' work at their controversial clinic, or maybe she had been the victim of a robbery gone wrong, since Susan's expensive jewelry appeared to be missing. However, one of Susan's friends would locate the jewelry hidden in Susan's underwear drawer later that night. Now, there's a reason that the jewelry was there, and we'll come to find that Dr. John Hamilton placed it there after he called the police. And he will give his explanation as to why he did this by saying he was worried because there was going to be strangers in the house and he didn't want them to see the jewelry, as in like he thought that maybe the paramedics and the police would steal Susan's jewelry. Or maybe he thought Susan's friends and family who would come over and mourn with him would steal Susan's jewelry. And it's just a funny thing to be concerned about when your wife is dead on the bathroom floor and you just found this out minutes ago. But let's quickly go over what else was found at the crime scene besides the two blood-soaked ties that, by the way, belonged to Dr. John Hamilton. When first responders arrived to the Hamilton home, John was performing CPR on his motionless wife. But the method he was using was unlike anything the paramedics had ever seen. John had one hand on Susan's chest and the other on her abdomen. So instead of lacing his fingers together and placing both his interlocked hands over her chest, he was doing this weird thing with one hand on her chest and one on her abdomen, which I don't think is probably super effective. And remember... John Hamilton's a doctor, so he technically should know better. And also remember that John was not wearing shoes, just blood-stained socks. But a pair of Ferragamo dress shoes were found in the master bathroom with Susan's body. And those shoes not only had bloodstains on the soles, but also inside of the shoes. And bloody footprints were found throughout the house. Now, John Hamilton would not initially be asked to answer for these oddities. However, he would give a very strange explanation later during his trial. We're going to talk about that. But something that was found by crime scene techs caused law enforcement to look more closely at Susan's husband, Dr. John Hamilton. What they found were two Valentine's Day cards. There was a card from Susan to John that was found in the trunk of John's 1996 Jaguar, along with almost $4,000 in cash, which investigators believed came from John's cash-only private clinic. There was also a card from John to Susan that was found in the kitchen of the home, along with a heart-shaped box of chocolate and a stuffed bear. Now, what was written in these cards led law enforcement to consider that the Hamilton's perfect storybook marriage may have been falling apart. In his card to Susan, John wrote, quote, I know this has been a difficult time for us. We are important, loving, caring people together. My life would be incomplete without you. I love you, end quote. And what Susan wrote in her card that was intended for her husband was a little bit less optimistic. So the generic card message, you know, the one that that is already written in there for you, that was pretty nice. It said, quote, I love being your wife. I love waking up with you and starting the day with your kisses. I love thinking about you during busy afternoons and daydreaming about the next time we'll be alone together, end quote. But the handwritten statement next to that gushy pre-written and standard Valentine's Day message was less optimistic because Susan added her own thoughts. She drew a line from the sentence that said, I love being your wife. And then she wrote in, quote, obviously, I bought this before last Monday, end quote. (laughs) What? Savage. Why even bother giving him the card at that point? Damn. So now the Oklahoma City Police Department wants to know, What the hell happened last Monday? What the hell happened last Monday to make Susan be such a savage in an otherwise sweet and romantic hallmark moment? So they started talking to people who knew the Hamiltons as a couple. And that's when it was revealed to them that Susan was having suspicions that her husband John was having an affair and she was considering 
divorce. Next door to the Hamiltons lived another Susan. Her name was Susan Johnston. And she and Susan Hamilton were not only neighbors, but very close friends. Susan Johnston told detectives that the week before Valentine's Day, she had talked to Susan Hamilton about her marriage. And Susan Johnston said, quote, Susan had noticed that John was getting a lot of cell calls. I think she became particularly alarmed when he didn't answer all of them. And he finally told her that it was a patient who was down on her luck and was having a hard time and he was helping her out, end quote. Now, obviously, Susan Hamilton didn't entirely buy what John was selling, so she investigated, and she found out that John's cell phone records had over 60 calls during a three-month period. And these calls were to and from an exotic dancer named Aliana Alguerri. Now, I'm going to give you more information about this alleged affair and this woman in later in the video. So just be patient with me. But right now, the police are like, okay, Susan Hamilton is dead on Valentine's Day. Her husband is the one who found her. Not everything is really adding up. They're going to find more. So when forensics comes in to process everything, they're going to find more stuff that makes everything look suspicious. So now they're not necessarily thinking, Maybe it's some outside um, picketer or some protester. They're not thinking maybe it's a robbery gone wrong because there's nothing missing, right, besides the jewelry, which would later be found. Now the police are looking at the person that they always kind of technically go and look towards initially when a woman is found dead, and that's going to be the husband or the partner. John Hamilton was placed in a squad car outside of his house. Uh, before he was transported to the police station around 1 p.m. But his behavior in the squad car and then at the police station was a very bizarre. So in the car, John randomly started scraping his knuckles against the mesh screen covering the window. You know, the screen that's there so you can't, like, escape the squad car or you can't, like, lunge at the police in the front seat of the squad car. So he's scraping his knuckles against this mesh screen, which is made out of metal. He also started banging his head into that mesh screen. And like I said, these screens are made out of metal, steel usually. So these actions of scraping and banging were not gentle on John or his head and knuckles. So once they had John in an interview room, police found him to be a bit uncooperative. He had been clutching a white kitchen towel in his hands when he was brought into custody, and he refused to turn this towel over to the detectives because he claimed he couldn't let go of it since it had belonged to his wife, the kitchen towel. This white kitchen towel had belonged to his wife, so apparently it has some really special meaning. This basic, plain-ass white kitchen towel. John also did not want to give the police the sports coat that he was wearing because he said Susan had bought it for him. Detective Mike Burke would later testify that John Hamilton behaved differently when police were out of the interview room than he did when they were present. Burke said, quote, he would put his hands over his face and acted worried while we were in the room. When we were with him, he would cry, but there were no tears. When he was alone, he didn't cry. He couldn't assist us when we tried to take his clothing. When we would leave, he would stand up and walk on his own back and forth in the room, end quote. Detective Burke also said that John did not want to be left alone in the interview room, and he requested that the police leave the door cracked when they left the interview room. Another detective, Jimmy Hatfield, described John Hamilton as being distraught at times, upset and hysterical, but... There were also times when he was eerily and completely calm. A recording was taken of John Hamilton while he was being interrogated by police, and they noticed that John continually looked at his shoulder area. And this led detectives to wonder if maybe John was checking for injuries. They also asked themselves if maybe John had been acting up in the squad car, banging his knuckles and head into that steel mesh screen so that he would have an explanation for any scratches or abrasions on him. Susan herself had defensive wounds, fingernail scratches at her throat where the coroner believed she had attempted to pull the tie from her neck as she was being strangled with it. And as I mentioned earlier, Susan, when she was found, she was in rough shape. Her head had been repeatedly slammed into the hard tile floor of the bathroom, and she'd been hit on the left side of her head with a blunt instrument three times. Now, this blunt instrument, what police in the coroner believed to be the murder weapon, it was never found, even though police did search the house. They also searched John's vehicle and his locker at Mercy Hospital. 
And after being at the police station for a few hours, John Hamilton was arrested at 5 p.m. on Valentine's Day, and he would be held at the Oklahoma City Jail with no bail. Now, what is surprising is that throughout the police investigation and the following court proceedings, Dr. John Hamilton received an outpouring of support from friends, colleagues, and patients because none of them believed that he could have done anything to hurt his beloved Susan. And when I say an outpouring, I mean like an outpour, like a a tsunami of support. One neighbor said, quote, they were always together. They seemed like the ideal couple. I'd hate to think that Dr. Hamilton had anything to do with this, end quote. Diane McDaniel, a patient of Dr. Hamilton's for over 20 years, said, quote, if asked if he could do it, I'd say there's no way he could have killed anything. He's a very kind man. I wouldn't think he could hurt a fly, end quote. And this one, Diane's statement. It gets me every time I read it because maybe this patient wasn't familiar with John's work at his private clinic. And don't get me wrong. A person's medical decisions are none of my business and I don't judge anybody. But objectively, like objectively and medically, I think we can agree. If you are a person who at any time puts a stop to a beating heart, whether you personally deem that heart to be attached to something that's considered a person or not, you technically are ending a life, right? Like you you are. You're you're taking life away from an organism. And reportedly John Hamilton did this several dozen times a week for a hefty cash amount, as is evidenced by the four thousand dollars in his trunk. So it's just funny to me. I think maybe this patient was a patient of his with his OBGYN practice and really wasn't familiar with what he was doing at his private clinic because Once again, I don't judge anybody. You do what you got to do. Completely understand it. I'm not standing in judgment. I I know this is a hot button topic and I don't want anybody to get upset. But just objectively, factually, John Hamilton clearly was capable of of taking a life. Right. So um, I think it's just an ironic statement. I think all of these statements are ironic, by the way. All the people who are like, oh, he loved her so much. They were perfect together. How could this happen? I can't believe it. You never really know what's going on in somebody's marriage or relationship or life behind closed doors. You might see an image of two people who have it all together, who seem to be desperately in love, who seem to be perfect, but no one is perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect relationship that doesn't include arguments or, um, you know, disagreements. And I think that anybody who will just immediately dismiss the idea that a man could have killed his wife because he loved her is really being a little bit short-sighted. And I will also say, in my opinion, Dr. John Hamilton was very concerned with his image, with the image he projected, with the image that people saw, because both he and his wife, Susan, were very much into the whole kind of social and charity and the whole country club scene. There's a lot of pressure when you're involved heavily with those kinds of things to project an image that you have it all together, right? Especially if you're a doctor and you want patients and you want people to trust in you. Well, Dr. Karen Reisig, we heard from her earlier, she actually saw John the morning of February 14th in the doctor's lounge, and she'd been in practice with John for 12 years. She said, quote, I can't hardly believe what's happened. I've never seen him in a rage type capacity. I do know he was just head over heels in love with her, end quote. Susan's nephew, John Shibley, said, quote, their marriage always seemed happy. I never heard them say a cross word to each other ever. A lot of us just want to believe that he didn't do it, but the media and the police are kind of making that hard to do. He has been viewed as a family member all this time, end quote. Even though he was still in the county jail, John Hamilton requested to be allowed to attend his wife Susan's funeral on February 20th, and the district judge approved this request, as did the family of Susan Hamilton, although John would be required to be in the custody of the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department, and he would also have to pay the costs for his transportation to and from the services, as well as for the time of the sheriff's deputies who had to guard him. So the very next day, though, after the funeral, on February 20th, First, John Hamilton was charged with the first-degree murder of Susan Hamilton. 
Of course, John and his legal team immediately entered a plea of not guilty, and they filed a motion for John to receive bail on March 7th. And included in this motion was another tsunami of support. There were dozens of letters, 54 in total, from people vouching for John Hamilton to be allowed bail. John's daughter, Shannon, wrote, quote, My dad is a kind and caring man. He is a calm, quiet, and gentle man. I have never seen in my life him raise his hand in anger, only love, end quote. Cheryl Sanders, a nurse who worked with John since 1989, claimed, quote, he has been a little down recently, but he did not allow it to affect his work or his relationship with his patients. He was always very quiet about his problems. He has always been a very calm, responsible individual that displayed a great love for his wife, end quote. The district attorney, Robert Macy, would not agree to grant bail to John Hamilton, stating that the murder was extremely violent. Hamilton's attorney, Mac Martin, asserted that his client should receive bail because he didn't pose a threat to himself, to society, or to any other individual. Now, as the date of the murder trial approached, John Hamilton was granted permission to leave jail once again so that he could accompany his lawyers to the house that he had once shared with his wife before her life had been violently stolen from her. This little field trip was intended to help John build his defense, but since the house was in Susan's name and it had become part of her estate when she died, he and his legal team had to get permission from the estate attorneys and pay them an hourly fee before entering the residence. Now, I have my theory about how exactly being in that house helped John Hamilton build his defense, but we're going to circle back to that when we talk about his trial. So at the time when they were preparing for the trial, it had been up in the air about whether or not the state was going to request the death penalty. But shortly before the trial, the district attorney, Wes Lane, told the Sepulpa Daily Herald that medical testimony would not allow them to seek the death penalty. So John Hamilton would either be facing life in prison or life in prison without the possibility of parole. Wes Lane said that in order to go after the death penalty, they would have to be able to prove that Susan's death was heinous, atrocious, or cruel. And Wesleyan said, quote, they can't say if she was conscious when she suffered the severe beating. If she was not alive, the beating was not heinous, atrocious, or cruel, end quote. And to that I ask, what kind of society have we created where the intentional taking of someone's life is not just on its own seen as especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel? What world are we living in? Because in my opinion, if you intentionally take somebody's life, if you intentionally murder somebody, especially if that somebody's your wife, death penalty, electric chair, immediately, okay? We don't need to debate whether it was heinous, atrocious, or cruel because I guarantee you if Susan was killed by her husband, John, just the idea that he was the one taking her life was heinous, atrocious, and cruel to her. What do I know? What do I know? So on December 4th, 2001, the jury selection began, and after three days of questioning, five men and seven women were chosen to sit in judgment of Dr. John Hamilton. Now, this is the time when everything starts coming out, because up until now, we haven't really heard anything especially damning about John Hamilton. But during the trial, we will. At least in my opinion, it was all pretty damning especially his own testimony. During opening statements, District Attorney Wes Lane addressed the jury saying, quote, Someone said there is a fine line between love and hate, and that man crossed it, end quote. Pure poetry, Wes Lane. I love it. That man crossed it. He crossed that fine line between love and hate. So the prosecution would claim that they believed John Hamilton had killed his wife in their master bathroom. He had then changed his clothes and he took his bloody clothes as well as the murder weapon out of the house. And then he disposed of the murder weapon and the bloody clothes in some unknown location, probably like a dumpster or maybe some incinerator of some kind. Wes Lane gave the jury a little taste of the testimony that they would hear during the trial, including blood spatter analysis and statements from people who had talked to Susan in the days and weeks before her murder. John's defense attorney, Mac Martin, during his opening statements, he told the jury, quote, John and Susan Hamilton were head over heels in love with each other. The evidence will show she was just as much in love with him, end quote. I mean, she's not the one on trial for killing him, so I mean, I don't think her love is in question here. Okay, Mac Martin, 
Don't think it is. Mac Martin also claimed that the Oklahoma City Police Department had focused on his client as their murderer and ignored all other evidence, stating, quote, the prosecution will present one theory. Anything else? They don't want you to hear. The police said, there's my man. Let's go find some experts to prove our case, end quote. However, it wasn't just these experts testifying to this added texture of what had otherwise been presented as a happy and fulfilled marriage. It was the people who knew Susan, including her best friend of almost 40 years, Sherry Coffey, and Susan's own daughter and her own mother. So Sherry Coffey, Susan's friend, she said that Susan had told her on February 7th that she thought her husband was having an affair. Sherry said that Susan still loved John. She just didn't feel that she could ever trust him again. Now, this is going to bring us back to Alenia Aguari, the exotic dancer who John Hamilton had been having a lot of communication with. This woman and John Hamilton both denied that they'd been having an affair or any intimate relationship, and they both agreed that she had been a patient of Dr. Hamilton's and he had been helping her out by giving her samples of depression medication that she was unable to get herself because she didn't have insurance and couldn't afford the out-of-pocket costs of the medication that John claimed she needed badly because she was talking about taking her own life. Aliana, also known as Nina, claimed that she'd first met John at his abortion clinic in the early 90s, but she would become a patient at his OBGYN practice. And saying OBGYN practice just kind of registered something in my head because we know John Hamilton was a doctor, but is it common practice for an OBGYN to prescribe or just hand out like candy depression medication to his patients? I'm not really sure. Like personally, my OB has never done that or even asked like, hey, do you do you feel depressed? Do you need depression medication? Like I thought that was something for your primary care physician or your psychiatrist or your psychologist, you know, but that that's odd, right? Like how would this even come up? And that does bring me to the point that it seemed like John was acting a little bit outside of his professional relationship with Nina by giving her his personal phone number, by having 60 phone calls with her in a short period, by giving her medication that maybe he wasn't necessarily, I don't know, supposed to be giving her. And although she claimed there had never been anything sexual between them, Nina did admit that she'd performed two lap dances for the good doctor at two Oklahoma City strip clubs. And she said that he'd paid her $100 and then $80 for these two dances when these dances normally only cost $20. She also said that sometimes John Hamilton would call her more than 10 times a day. So I, I even just if you take away John Hamilton as her OB, giving her depression medication for free and, and giving her samples and not having an actual prescription on file, which can be dangerous all on its own, right? Because let's say Nina goes to another doctor and they have her medical records and they don't see that she's actually taking this, what is, you know, a prescription medication. They don't see she's taking it. And then they give her another medication that interacts badly with that prescription medication that she's taking, but they don't know she's taking because it's not in her file because John Hamilton's just handing her out, you know, samples like it's Halloween and she's trick-or-treating, that could have bad implications, I'm just saying. And so take all that away, though. The man went to her and got lap dances, and then he paid her like three, four times as much for the lap dances as she would normally charge. Maybe he was just trying to help her. Maybe he was like, she won't take money from me unless I enlist her services, and she really badly needs help. You know, she's talking about taking her own life. So I'm going to give her some anti-depression medication samples and also let her give me lap dances because then she'll feel fulfilled in life and she'll be less depressed. That is actually how men probably think. Some of them. I'm not saying all of them. I'm sorry. I don't like to be, you know, make generalizations, but that is probably how some men actually really think. All right. So on February 8th, just a week before Valentine's Day, Susan Hamilton discovered the phone calls that were being made between her husband and a woman who he claimed was a patient in a time of need, but who also was a patient that danced naked for him in exchange for money. So like I said, I, I think it's safe to say that some professional lines were crossed in this relationship between John and Nina. And I don't know if Susan even knew about the lap dances, but after she confronted John about the multiple calls, some of which had even been made while she and John were on vacation, 
John Hamilton wrote Nina a letter telling her that he could no longer be her doctor. John told Nina that he loved his wife and did not want to get a divorce. Now, according to those close to Susan, she would brought up the topic of divorce with John just two days before she was murdered. It was also discovered that they had fought. John and Susan had fought about John giving his son money without discussing it with Susan. Susan's best friend, Sherry Coffey, also testified that shortly before her death, Susan had changed her mind and no longer believed that her husband was having an affair. John Hamilton was also in contact with Sherry Coffey, calling her almost every day in the week leading up to his wife's murder. Sherry said, quote, John said that she had said something about divorce. Susan never said that to me. John would have been devastated, end quote. So this is weird because according to Sherry Coffey, Susan did tell her about the affair, but Susan had never discussed with her getting a divorce from John. John, who in my opinion was trying to write his own narrative with Susan's best friend, Sherry, he's calling Sherry every day and he's like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. I really regret this. Like I would never do anything. You know I would never do anything to hurt Susan. She's the only one for me. But she's talking about divorce now and I'm scared. And Sherry's like, well, she never talked about divorce with me. Which makes me believe that Susan actually did talk about divorcing John with John. And John thought that Susan had talked to Sherry about it. So he was trying to get ahead of it. But Susan hadn't talked to Sherry about it, right? So, and then Sherry said that John would have been devastated. Angela Horton, who was Susan's daughter from her first marriage with Dick Horton, she also testified, saying she'd spoken to her mother on the phone the night before she died. Angela said that her mother didn't sound like herself at all, even though Susan tried to put on a brave face during the early portions of their conversation. Angela Horton said, quote, She said, I'm scared, and I've never felt so alone in my life. She was very upset, very sad. You could tell she was crying. She didn't sound like my mom, end quote. This is the night before Susan's death. Susan had told her daughter Angela about her suspicions that John had been unfaithful. But Susan also told her daughter that she and John were attempting to work through their issues. Angela also spoke to her stepfather, John Hamilton, before Susan's murder. And he had reassured her that there was no truth at all to the affair allegations. Angela said that John told her that she knew how much he loved her mother and he would never hurt Susan. Susan's mother, Louise Shipley, also testified that she thought Susan and John had a good marriage, although Susan would feel smothered by her husband from time to time. Susan's daughter, Angela, reiterated this, saying, quote, she loved to talk to John. She loved him. But at the time, she insinuated that it was too much, end quote. The Hamiltons were together all the time. They frequently booked trips away. They had regularly scheduled lunch dates. They worked together at the clinic twice a week. And John called Susan regularly throughout the day. He always wanted to be in touch with her. But maybe Susan felt like, you know, chill, dude. We've been together for like 15 years. Like, let me live, man. Let me breathe. Both Susan's mother and daughter also mentioned the money that John had given his son for some car repairs. And apparently this really felt like a betrayal and a dishonesty for Susan. She was very bothered by it because John hadn't bothered to run it by her. He hadn't talked to her about it. He hadn't, you know, discussed anything with her. And at Christmas time, Susan told her daughter Angela that she'd asked John to move out of the house. Angela said, quote, she was really upset that he lied to her. She felt deceived, end quote. So you can really see Susan's asking John to move out of the house in December, right? Just a few months before Valentine's Day. She feels John lied to her, wasn't honest with her. She's already losing trust. Now in February, she discovers all these calls between John and his young female patient, who's an exotic dancer. Susan once again feels a hit of betrayal. She once again feels like a loss of trust with her husband. So you can really understand why after those two things combined, she may have brought up divorce to John or a separation of some kind. Like, I need to feel like I can trust you and I don't right now. So I don't really see why we should be having this relationship when I can't trust you. Now let's talk about the doctors and medical staff who had interactions with John Hamilton on the morning of February 14th. The timeline of John's morning is as follows. He was up early so he could 
be at the clinic for a procedure, which started at 7 a.m. and was done by 8 a.m. After this, and after being seen in the doctor's lounge by a colleague at around 8.30 a.m., John decided to take the short drive from Mercy Hospital to his house to exchange Valentine's Day cards with his wife, arriving there around 8.40 a.m. At 9.20 a.m., John left the house to return to the hospital for his scheduled surgery, but only after the hospital had paged him. After this surgery went successfully, John changed out of his scrubs back into his street clothes and headed home to grab his address book before he was going to be heading out to do some more doctorly work. This is when he found Susan's body. This is when he started doing CPR and mouth-to-mouth resuscitation on Susan, which is when he claims he got blood on his socks and on the inside of his shoes. During the trial, a nurse named Sarah Cox testified. And she said that John Hamilton was very late to his surgery that morning, and the patient was seconds away from being sedated when she and the anesthesiologist realized that Dr. John Hamilton was not in the hospital. Cox also said that John had requested to start the 9 a.m. surgery earlier, and he was paged by a nurse at 8.50 a.m. when the patient was ready, but he did not arrive to scrub in until nearly 50 minutes later. Cox said, quote, We had the patient at a critical state. The syringe was attached, and they were getting ready to push the tube. She wasn't asleep. She was sedated. A doctor and a nurse had to physically stay with her. End quote. According to this nurse, Sarah Cox, the anesthesiologist became upset when John Hamilton called and said he was going to be late and asked for his patient not to be put under yet. And when John arrived, he had no explanation for his lateness. Dr. Donald Rahal, who was John's surgical partner for that surgery, he would testify that they did have a quick 20-second conversation about why John was late while they were scrubbing in. And Dr. Rahal said, quote, he said he was trying to get a Valentine's Day present for his wife, but he ran out of time, end quote. Now, the prosecution is going to show records from New Leaf Floral. It's a flower shop. And these records showed that on February 12th, John Hamilton had paid $158 for flowers that were supposed to have been picked up before noon on February 14th but they were never picked up. So I'm not sure why John has to rush around to get a a Valentine's Day present for his wife when he already had one ready to go that he paid almost $200 for. He just failed to pick these flowers up. Dr. Rahal also said that in his opinion, John acted completely normal during the 30-minute surgery. But nurse Sarah Cox did not agree. Cox described John Hamilton as being more talkative than usual that morning. He even took the time to explain anatomy and the disease process to a student nurse. And Cox remembered thinking how odd it was because Dr. Hamilton was usually very reserved, very quiet. He didn't talk if there was nothing to be said. Cox also said she lost respect for Dr. John Hamilton during that day's surgery because one time while they were working, he had whistled at her when he wanted her to move a light. And Sarah Cox said, quote, I took offense at him whistling at me to get my attention. I informed him I had a name. He just went ahead and asked me to move the light. End quote. Good for you, Sarah. Good for I have a name, dude. You know, so it's so funny that Dr. Rahal who was in the surgery with John is like, oh, his behavior was absolutely normal. And Susan Cox is over here is like, no, it wasn't. You don't be just whistling at your nurses in the operating room. Like, who do you think you are? Patrick Dempsey? Are you McDreamy over here? Like, what's happening? Okay, this isn't Grey's Anatomy. You use my name. Call me by my name. Sergeant Larry Sanders of the Oklahoma City Police Department also testified, saying that John had told him that he'd returned home at 8.30 a.m. to exchange cards with Susan and that he'd been paged around 9 a.m., at which time he'd left home and driven to the hospital to get to his surgery. Now, the defense team, John's lawyers, they would use this very small window of 30 minutes to show that John could not have possibly murdered his wife, hidden his bloody clothes and the murder weapon, and cleaned up quickly enough before having to leave so that he wouldn't be late for the surgery. But the reality of the situation is that John was late to his surgery, and he would have had time to murder Susan and get rid of the evidence. He was paged at 8.50 a.m., but he didn't arrive at the hospital until 9.40 a.m., and the hospital is only an eight-minute drive from the Hamilton home. 
So during the trial, John's 911 call was played, and the pictures of the crime scene and Susan's body were shown to the jury, at which point John turned his head away from the monitor that's placed on the defense table, unable to look at the bloody scene. Three jury members broke down in tears as they viewed the photographs, because, like I said, this is brutal, what happened to Susan. These jurors couldn't even comprehend how someone could do that to another human being. And Dr. Jeffrey Gofton, a forensic pathologist with the state's medical examiner's office, he testified that he believed Susan had died from possibly three blows to the head with a blunt instrument, and one of those blows had crushed her head, creating a hole in her skull. Sergeant Larry Spruill, who was a crime scene investigator who'd been with the police department for 18 years, he gave some damning testimony. And he told the jury that he'd found Susan's blood and a piece, a small piece of her flesh in John's Jaguar, which was parked under an awning in front of the house. This is huge. Blood and flesh belonging to Susan Hamilton in John's vehicle, right? Remember, the prosecution is saying John killed her. And then he got his car. He drove somewhere. He got rid of the bloody clothes that he was wearing when he killed her and the murder weapon. And then he drove to the hospital. And if that was the case, it might explain why blood and flesh were found in John's car. But the defense team, Mac Martin, John's defense lawyer, he claimed they had an answer for that. <laughs> they had an answer for that. He said that when John had found his wife's body, he tried to save Susan by performing CPR and mouth to mouth, and he got her blood on him. But that's when he called 911. And then he realized after he called 911, like, oh shit, my car is parked in the driveway under the awning, and it's going to be blocking the emergency vehicles from getting into the driveway and getting close to the house. So John then went outside to move his car. But when he got inside his car, his hands were shaking too much for him to place the key in the ignition. So he gave up and he went back inside to wait for first responders. However, there was no blood found on John's car keys, no blood found on the outside of the car, such as, you know, the handle of the door that you might touch when you're opening the door and you have blood on you. And although there were bloody footprints inside the house, none of these footprints led to the door or out into the driveway. The prosecution questioned Sergeant Sproul, who's the CSI guy, about how this would have been possible if what the defense was saying was true. And Sproul answered that he didn't know, but he personally found it to be unusual. He said, quote, I didn't find any evidence of a blood trail leading up to the front door. We don't have a weapon. Somebody had to leave, end quote. And Sproul also had a theory on how this could have happened. He said that after the murder, the killer took a shower and let the water run for an extended period of time. The attacker then poured drain cleaner down the drain to prevent law enforcement from finding blood in the shower or in the shower drain before the killer changed into different clothes and concealing the bloody clothes in a bag, he carried them out of the house. So you might say, how did blood and um, you know, Susan's flesh get in the car? Well, I think it's possible that the killer, aka Dr. John Hamilton, may have been wearing the same shoes, the Ferragamo loafers, not realizing that there was blood inside and outside of them. He also may have, when he was putting the bloody clothes and everything into the bag, some of it could have gotten on the outside of the bag. And when he placed the bag into his car, that transferred. It just doesn't have to be, you know, tons of blood and flesh laying all over the car. When a CSI tech goes in, they're going to find any trace of blood and flesh. And I think just in particular or in general, finding Susan's blood and flesh in John's car is suspicious and doesn't really um, add up to any of the stories he was telling. So the police also had found a small running space heater in the bathroom with Susan's body. And Sproul, the CSI guy, he believed that the killer had placed it there and turned the heat up so that the water in the shower would evaporate. And when the police got there, they wouldn't realize that somebody had recently taken a shower. Detective Sproul said, quote, there is physical evidence missing from this crime scene. Someone got out of that room without leaving a bloody trail. I can only speculate how, end quote. Sergeant Spruill also testified that he believed the attack on Susan happened very quickly and she had fought to free herself from the necktie wrapped around her throat. And he said, quote, she was taken down almost immediately and spun onto her face. I don't think it took very long at all. I would say less than two minutes, end quote, which would give John Hamilton time to show up, 
to, you know, his house that he lived in with Susan, find Susan in the bathroom because Susan had plans that day. Susan was naked when her body was found because she was getting ready to go out and meet with a friend and she was getting ready in the bathroom. So John Hamilton would have had plenty of time to leave the hospital, get to the house, attack her in the bathroom, especially if the attack took less than two minutes, and then maybe 20 minutes to clean up, you know, the murder weapon, the bloody clothes, things like that, because he didn't clean up the majority of the crime scene. You know, it's not like he had tried to shampoo those bloody footprints out or wipe them off the floor or anything like that. And not only were fingernail scratches found on Susan's throat, but prosecutors claimed that fingernail scratches had also been found on John Hamilton's shoulder at the time of his arrest, which his defense team disputed, saying that there was no way for the police or prosecution to prove that the marks on John's shoulder were scratches. They could simply just be marks that could have come from multiple sources besides fingernails. So Ross Martin Gardner of Atlanta, Georgia, he's one of the nation's leading blood spatter experts, and he told the jury that if John Hamilton had not killed his wife, he'd certainly been in the house when she was killed. He said, quote, Dr. Hamilton was present when the killer was active. There is no other conclusion possible, end quote. When Susan was found, she was, like I said, completely nude. Her hair was still wet as if she'd recently gotten out of the shower. And like I said, it turns out she'd made plans to meet with a friend at 930 that morning. And in order to be there on time, Susan would have needed to leave the house by 920, which is clearly what she was getting ready to do. D.A. West Lane told NBC News that this meant if John Hamilton was not responsible for Susan's death, whoever was would have been arriving as John was leaving to go back to the hospital. Or the person had been inside the house, lying in wait the whole time, just waiting for John Hamilton to leave and go back to the hospital, even though there were hours and hours and hours before John Hamilton arrived back home to exchange Valentine's Day cards with his wife, where the killer could have struck and killed Susan. But he just, for some reason, waited for John Hamilton to come and go. Gardner said that he'd come to this conclusion that John Hamilton was in the house when his wife was murdered based on blood on Hamilton's shoes and the white dress shirt that John Hamilton was wearing at the time of his arrest. Now, remember that a pair of Ferragamo dress shoes, loafers, were found in the master bathroom with Susan's body. And not only did they have blood on the outside, but the inside as well. Gardner testified that blood on the left shoe had come from four different directions, meaning the shoe was in motion at the time the blood landed on it. There was also a smaller amount of Susan's blood on three separate areas of John's right shoe. Ross Martin Gardner stated that two blood spatter events had happened in that bathroom. The first was when Susan's head was smashed into the hard tile of the bathroom floor, and the second happened when she was struck with that blunt instrument. But all of the spatter at the scene had come from a single point, which was Susan's head. There was no blood spatter on John's pants or socks that matched the ones found on his shoes. And if John had been wearing the same clothes the entire time, Ross Gardner would have expected to see this. Now, when he was asked to consider four alternative possibilities for how this particular blood spatter pattern could have been created, Gardner did just that. He was asked if the blood spatter on John Hamilton could have been created while he was giving Susan mouth to mouth. And Gardner said that he had eliminated this theory because there were no blood spatters on the white dress shirt. And that shirt, along with all of Hamilton's other clothing, should have shown the same pattern of blood spatter. Gardner also didn't believe that Susan could have caused this blood spatter on John's shoes from exhaling while she was dying. He said there was no aerosol type spatters on Susan, but there were those multi-directional blood spatters on John's shoes. When asked if dripping droplets of blood could have created the blood spatter, Gardner said no. There was no dripping pattern and the spatter on the shoes was not consistent with dripping blood. And finally, Gardner was asked if the blood spatter could have been created by John walking through the large puddle of blood around his wife's head on the bathroom floor. And Gardner said he had dismissed this theory because droplets of blood in that scenario would have been projected away from the shoe, not onto it. And once again, the blood had come from four different directions. Now, Ross Gardner had been able to recreate the murder in the way he believed it had happened due to the evidence. And he said 
that the killer would have needed to have walked past Susan in the bathroom in order to grab the neckties that were later found around her neck and under her body because these ties were located in a closet that was opposite the bathroom door. Gardner felt that the attack began on the opposite side of the room from where the ties were located, so the killer would have needed to walk past Susan a second time when he grabbed the ties and walked back. Now, this is kind of you know, suggesting that maybe Susan wasn't alarmed that somebody was walking around her bedroom because it was somebody she knew. And in this portion of his testimony, Gardner said, quote, even if she wasn't facing the killer, there were mirrors and she would have seen the killer. She wasn't alarmed by the presence of the killer. The attack happened very quickly. There is not a significant disturbance. She's not up and fighting, end quote. He also stated that the large pool of blood in the bathroom had started to coagulate before it was disturbed, which suggested a passage of time between the murder and the disturbance, which supported the prosecution's theory of John killing Susan during his first trip home and then pretending to find her and giving her CPR after his surgery that morning. In fact, the prosecution believed that John Hamilton had been trying to clean up the bathroom before he was interrupted by the page from the hospital due to a wet rag left in the pool of blood surrounding Susan's head. Now, the DA, Wes Lane, feels this proves it was not some opportunistic thief because why would someone like that make any effort to clean up the crime scene? And although the murder weapon was never located, a bloody impression had been found on John Hamilton's white dress shirt that Gardner believed matched the hole in Susan's skull. Gardner believed that the stains on the shirt were left by the murder weapon as it swung up, coming into contact with John and the shirt he was wearing. And Gardner would later tell NBC News, quote, we took a one to one image of Mrs. Hamilton's head, the injury, the laceration. We took a one to one image of his shirt and we overlay it. And you could overlay the pattern transfer right on top of the wound. And you see an immediate, I mean, they match up, end quote. So, what he means basically is whatever John used, like let's say he used, let's say he used oh, this wireless charger that is currently plugged into my microphone because I forgot to charge it. Let's say he used this and he was hitting Susan's head with this. This would cause, you know, a laceration, a mark on Susan's head. There was a hole in her skull and he's bringing it back up and it's, and when he's bringing it back up, it's hitting his shirt. It's going to cause a similar transfer pattern in blood on his shirt that's going to look like the wound on Susan's head. Now, there would be another blood spatter expert who would testify during John Hamilton's trial, someone who was even more renowned and sought after than Ross Martin Gardner, someone the defense had hired very shortly after John Hamilton's arrest, mainly because they wanted to make sure the prosecution couldn't hire him. Now, it's believed that it was this expert who would seal John Hamilton's fate. But before we talk about that, let's hear what John had to say for himself. Because Dr. John Hamilton decided to take the stand in his own defense, which in my personal opinion was probably a very ego-driven and misguided decision. John would tell the jury that he loved his wife Susan more than life itself, and she had forgiven him for any perceived wrongdoings. He had started seeing a mental health professional, and Susan had even agreed to go to marriage therapy with him. By Valentine's Day, John and Susan were on a healing path, moving forward and talking things out. He also refuted the claims that he was smothering, saying that Susan wanted to spend more time with him, not less. I mean, maybe that's what she told you, dude. <laughs> she knew she couldn't tell you that you were smothering her because you'd get upset and be all pouty about it, but... Okay. When John began talking to the jury about what he walked into on that fateful February morning, he started to get emotional. He said that he had stopped back at the house on his way from Mercy Hospital to his private clinic in northwest Oklahoma City. And when he reached the front door, he found it unlocked. And then in the kitchen, he found the coffee pot had been left on. So John started to call out Susan's name as he made his way upstairs. And as he reached the master bedroom, he could see a light turned on inside and he could hear the sound of a space heater. An emotional John told the jury, quote, I saw Susan lying on the floor right below my sink. There was a big area of blood above her head. She was kind of lying on her right side with her right arm stretched out. 
end quote. John then said he hollered at Susan. He grabbed her shoulder and then rolled her over onto her back before standing over her, his feet straddling her head. According to John, he, quote, kind of jumped over her to get to her right side and my shoes came off and I fell to my knees, end quote. John started performing CPR on Susan, and when he checked her pulse and couldn't find it, he struck her sternum with two sharp blows, hoping to jumpstart her heart, and then he began chest compressions. John said that he did several chest compressions. He hadn't counted, but he did notice that a bloody, frothy spew came out of Susan's mouth with every chest compression. And it was when he began to do mouth-to-mouth that John found the tie around Susan's neck, and he said, quote, I didn't know what to do. But as I tried to breathe for her, I pulled on it. It wouldn't come free. I felt some kind of knot under her head that I kind of undid. And as I'm doing that, her head kind of slipped off my arm and hit the floor. I had to pick it back up again, end quote. John then claims he loosened the tie and flung it to one side before continuing his attempts to revive his wife. Now, keep in mind, when first responders arrived, they did not see any evidence that John Hamilton had performed mouth-to-mouth resuscitation on his wife. David Bradbury, a firefighter who arrived at the scene that morning, said, quote, The way that this woman had been beaten, I mean, her face was swollen. Her face was bloody. I didn't notice any blood on his mouth whatsoever, end quote. I think that's damning. That's one of the biggest things for me, okay? That is what I will say, but I'm going to continue on. John Hamilton claims that he tried to save his wife, but when she didn't respond, he grabbed his shoes and moved towards his phone, which was on the bathroom sink. He paused to wash his hands and make an unsuccessful attempt to put his shoes back on because, you know, he jumped out of them. He just jumped out of them five minutes before. But when he couldn't put his shoes back on for some reason, even though they're loafers and they're slip-on shoes, he then kicked the shoes before he called 911. John also said that he had a feeling Susan's killer might still be in the house, so he walked to the bedroom closet before going downstairs and attempting to move his car for the emergency vehicles to access the driveway. On his way out of the bedroom, he claims he saw Susan's jewelry tree, and so he hid it in her underwear drawer because he knew that strangers were going to be in the house. John said that once he got to his car, his hands were shaking so badly that he was unable to get the key in the ignition. However, they were not shaking too badly for him to dial 911 and then use a button on his keychain to unlock his car. He sat in the driver's seat. His hands ran over the steering wheel. But then he gave up on the idea of moving the car, so he went back into the house, and he held his wife in his arms until the firefighters arrived. Now, once again, keep in mind, Susan's blood was inside the car, but not on his key fob, not on the outside of the car. And there were no bloody footprints leading to the front door, even though John greeted first responders wearing blood-soaked socks, and bloody footprints were found wandering around other places in the house, like the closet where the ties were. The district attorney mentioned that Susan had been talking about getting a divorce two days before her murder, and he asked John Hamilton, quote, isn't it true that your greatest asset was about to leave you and you twisted off? She pushed your buttons. You twisted off and that's why you killed her, end quote. Apparently, twisted off means lost control. I had to look that up. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious. Twisted off, lost it. You know, I get it, but never a a phrase I had heard before. And John Hamilton to this responded, quote, no, she was my greatest asset, and she's gone. I lost her, end quote. At the end of the day, the prosecution didn't believe a word of John's statement was true. They believed that he had spent his 10 months in jail silently learning what the state had against him, you know, because he gets that through discovery. That's what his lawyers have. They have all the evidence, all the access to the files that the prosecution has. And then using that and going on a field trip to his house with his lawyers, he was able to formulate a story that would explain away their incriminating evidence. As long as he could make his movements that morning match the crime scene, It didn't matter how bizarre his actions were because he could just say, well, my wife was dead and and I didn't know what to do and I was in shock. And so, yeah, I did things that didn't make sense, like walked around the bedroom, walked to the closet, jumped out of my shoes, went to my car and couldn't get it started. But I was in shock. How could anybody blame me? But I can explain my movements that will make all of these things add up to you. 
Now, let's discuss the testimony of the blood spatter expert hired by John's defense team, Tom Bevel. So Bevel was put on the stand to refute the testimony of Gardner, who was the blood spatter expert for the state. And basically, Bevel was going to question the theory that the blood stain on John's shirt matched the wound on Susan's head. And Bevel did a fairly consistent job for the defense here, essentially saying that although the blood stain could be an imprint of the murder weapon, to say that for sure the prosecution would have to have the murder weapon, and they did not. Bevel also said that the multi-directional blood spatter on John's shoes didn't necessarily mean that he'd been wearing them when he murdered Susan, and they could have been placed there while he performed CPR, saying, quote, he jumped out of his loafer shoes, which would have reoriented them. And he jumped over to her side and knelt down to try and assist her and do CPR, end quote. You think he said that with a straight face? It would have been hard. But on cross-exam, the district attorney, Wes Lane, asked Tom Bevel, a world or country-renowned forensics blood spatter expert, he asked him a question that would, as Lane put it, take all the air out of the courtroom. Lane asked Bevel if there was anything the state's experts or the police department had missed in their examination of the evidence. And to everyone's shock and surprise, Tom Bevel, the defense's prized expert witness, the first person they hired for the defense, he said yes. Actually, there were a few things the prosecution and the police had missed. Bevel had found blood both inside and outside of John Hamilton's right shirt sleeve. The CSI team and the prosecution's expert had both missed the blood on the inside of the sleeve. They'd seen the blood on the outside of the sleeve. They talked about it during the trial, but they'd missed the blood on the inside. Tom Bevel then testified that the most probable way this blood had gotten there was that it had sprayed into his sleeve as John murdered his wife, Susan. Now, remembering this dramatic turn of events in the courtroom, the DA, Wes Lane, said, quote, everything else was forgotten after that point. My heart started racing at that point in time. Everything in the courtroom went in slow motion. Then he's talking about the shirt, and I'm asking him to come down and show us, and it's all winging it, and it's getting better and better. I'll tell you, I will never have that experience again. That was my Perry Mason lifetime moment, end quote. It's cute how excited Wes Lane was about that. But later, Tom Bevel would say he hadn't done this out of spite or because he was trying to sabotage the very defense team that had paid him to be there. He did it because he'd been asked a question and he'd taken an oath to tell the truth, which was far more important to him than any obligation that he might have had to a paying client. Tom Bevel said that he felt he had no choice and his unexpected testimony was the last thing the jury heard before they went to deliberate. It took only two hours for the jury to find John Hamilton guilty of first-degree murder, and they recommended that he serve life in prison without the chance of parole, a sentence that he was handed by the judge two weeks later. Now, during the sentencing hearing, District Judge Ray Elliott told John Hamilton that he should be thankful for this sentence, stating, quote, based on communication with the jurors, they were very disappointed. They didn't have the sentence option of death. You should consider yourself very lucky, end quote. Damn, whoo. The judge is like, yo, the jury wanted to murder you. You should be happy that they couldn't do that. Just shut up, go to prison, and count your blessings instead of sheep. So an appeal was immediately filed because Mac Martin said he didn't want to delay the process of getting this conviction reversed. This appeal was denied. But then John Hamilton hired a new legal team headed by Robert Nye, and they appealed again, and this time going after blood spatter expert Tom Bevel and the district attorney's office. The defense attorneys claimed that they believed Bevel was a spy in the defense team, leaking critical information to the DA's office. And the DA, Wes Lane, had asked that bombshell question based on information he'd received from the spy, Tom Bevel. The court documents accused Bevel of lying to the defense team about what his testimony would be and then essentially helping the prosecution with their case. The documents also alleged that Bevel was questioned informally in the hallways of the courthouse and that during this informal questioning, he may have told a police homicide detective that he didn't believe Mac Martin, John Hamilton's lawyer, was going to have him testify, which suggested to the police officer that Tom Bevel had information the defense didn't want the jury to hear. So attorney Robert Nye, who is John Hamilton's new attorney at this point, he said, quote, never have I seen anything like it. I've never seen a case in which a defense witness provides the most devastating evidence for the state except this one. What is the motive? You mean for Bevel? He was a 27-year veteran of the Oklahoma City Police Department. After he retired, he worked for the Oklahoma County District Attorney's Office. I believe that's where his allegiance remained, end quote. Which, like, could all be true, right? Wesleyan could have been 
like the Oklahoma City Police Department's biggest fan. But you all knew that, or at least Mac Martin, John Hamilton's original attorney and the defense team, knew that when they hired him, when they like went out of their way to snatch him up so the prosecution couldn't, right? And Mac Martin made the decision to put Tom Bevel on the stand knowing that Bevel had some things that maybe the defense team didn't want the jury to hear. Now, of course, Wes Lane, the DA, and Tom Bevel, the blood spatter expert, they deny these allegations. Lane claims that his decision to ask that question was based on knowing Tom Bevel and his character. And Bevel said that he told the defense team about what he found long before the case ever went to trial. You know, he told them about the blood on the inside of John Hamilton's sleeve. He told them And that meant they put him on the stand knowing what he could potentially say if he was asked the right questions. Not only did Bevel tell the defense team what he had found as far as the blood on the inside of John Hamilton's sleep, but he told them what it meant. Bevel said, quote, Mac Martin said, I saw what you pointed out to me. Now, what does it mean? I said, your man did it. I mean, how much more blunt can you be? End quote. So Tom Bevel's basically like showing Mac Martin, like, you see this blood on the inside of the sleeve? And I can see how this went because Bevel probably wanted Mac Martin to like pick up on it, you know, himself. And and Mac Martin's like, yeah, I see the blood. There's blood all over all of these clothes. Like, what do you mean? What do you want from me? What am I supposed to be seeing here? And Tom Bevel's like, your client's guilty. Your client did it. <laughs> like, how much more blood can you be? So this appeal, which made its way all the way to the United States Supreme Court, was also denied and John Hamilton remained in prison where he still is today. Now, there are some people who believe that Hamilton is actually innocent of this crime, that the wrong man is behind bars. These people will say that the prosecution's theory of what happened doesn't make sense, that Dr. John Hamilton could not have possibly changed clothes and gotten to the hospital in time. I definitely believe that Dr. John Hamilton did this, and I believe that he absolutely was able to change out of his clothes, get to the hospital in time for his surgery, even though he wasn't in time, but get there, right? And he wasn't covered in blood when he arrived. Hospitals have incinerators. They have incinerators and they have um, receptacles and, and things for medical waste, like needles, hypodermic needles, things that could possibly carry bloodborne diseases, pathogens, things like that. They have those things. According to my research, the most likely way that hospitals get rid of this medical waste is by incinerating them. And a lot of hospitals have on-site incinerating machines or ovens or whatever to do it themselves, or they send it out to a company that will do it for them. But either way, ain't nobody going through those bags, you know? They're usually like red bags, and they have like a skull and crossbones on it, and it's like, warning, warning, biohazard waste, you know, dangerous, don't go in here. It's like not a clear bag, all right? So nobody would see Um, anything like bloody clothes or anything in these bags, they would just take them and throw them in the incinerator. So I I think it's very easy for John Hamilton to have gotten rid of the murder weapon and his bloody clothes. I think there's no other explanation for what happened to Susan Hamilton. And people might say, oh, he loved her so much. Yeah. Yeah. That's sometimes the most dangerous position to be in when a man loves you so much and you want to leave him, right? Because not only Could John Hamilton not really grapple with that fact that his wife would be leaving him and he'd have to live without her? But now he's got to deal with the public perception of his marriage and the ending of it. Now he has to feel that there's people out there who are going to say, wow, Susan Hamilton filed for divorce. I wonder what John did. They're going to start snooping around, nosing around. They're going to find out about this exotic dancer and the lap dances and the, you know, depression medication samples. It's all going to come out. Divorce filings are usually public record. Anybody with a computer could find this stuff. He did not want that to happen. And that is what I truly believe, that John Hamilton cared so much about his image, so much about what people thought about him, that he would rather them think his wife had been murdered by a random burglar than that she wanted to divorce him. And that is where I stand on this, but let me know what you think about it in the comments. Do you think it's possible John Hamilton didn't do this? Do you think there's a world that exists that John Hamilton didn't do this? I don't. But some people do still defend him, although those are probably the same people who were like, I can't even believe that he did this. He's so sweet. He loves his wife so much. Like, so what, man? Love can turn to hate real quick. The opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. All right, just remember that. And now we will dive into Stephanie's Small Business Showcase. Woo! 
So today's small business is a little bit different. It's called Meow Squad New York City Rescue or Meow Squad NYC Rescue. And the person writing me is also named Stephanie. And she says, hi, Stephanie. My name is also Stephanie. And I know I don't run the kind of business that you normally highlight. I run a small cat rescue in New York City. And if you would mention us, it could literally be life-saving. The rescue is called Meow Squad. And we rent an apartment to care for our kitties with volunteers coming in and out throughout the day. You're welcome anytime. I will probably take you up on that. I'm not far, just about five hours from New York City. You will find me there petting the cats. We perform trap neuter release on feral cats and adopt out wherever we can. I have nothing to sell per se, but if you could send followers our way, I would be eternally grateful. In modern rescue, followers not only mean donations, but it means our babies get seen and hopefully get those elusive forever homes they so desperately need. I just want for people to see them and understand the work we do. We try so hard for these kitties, and although I know it's not your usual, I figured I'd give it a shot. I know you're an animal lover too. I am. And I listen to your podcast as I'm cleaning the kitty apartment we call Meow Quarters. I should also mention I'm a funeral director in New York City, and a couple of times I felt very connected to cases you've covered. I'm including some links if you think we might be worthy of a quick little shout out. I appreciate you and all you do. Sincerely, Stephanie Castro. So I am going to link. It looks like I've got her Instagram and her TikTok. And oh, how cute a video she sent me. All right. So I definitely want you guys to go over to Meow Squad on Instagram and follow because you never know. One of these cute little kitties might pop up and catch your attention and catch your love and you can be responsible for giving a a beautiful, fuzzy, sweet, kind-hearted animal a forever home. And I love this. I don't care if it's a normal business that I usually showcase because it's a business that matters and it's an organization that matters and that's what we're all about, right? So go over and check out Meow Squad, New York City Rescue. Tell Stephanie that, you know, you're here and you say hello and that you appreciate the work she's doing for these kitties. And if you're in the New York City area, go and check her out, you know? Go and check her out. Volunteer your time. If they do take donations and you have a couple extra dollars to throw their way, then do that as well. I'm going to be making a donation to them today. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. And like I said, I don't know if I told you this in this video, but I did say this in on Instagram. If you don't follow me on Instagram, it's Stephanie Harlow on Instagram. Go ahead and follow me. But I'm starting a three-part deep dive series on a case that I've become completely obsessed with, can't get enough of. It's so twisty and turny. It's really going to be a great series. So that's coming next. Keep a lookout for that. I said that's coming next, not nest, but it sounded like nest. Keep an eye out for that. And until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go I got blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings